verse 8. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not you against the Lord, neither fear you the people of the land, for they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. For they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us, fear them not. Father, in the great name of Jesus Christ, we thank you. For your incomparable word, we thank you for the Spirit of God that is present in this place. And I pray now, God, that you would anoint my lips to speak the words of life, that they would find root in the hearts of those that are present. Lord, and that you would do the work that only you're able to do, that would we, we would leave here today knowing that we had met with you, communed with you as Abraham did in Genesis chapter 18. Lord, now I pray that you would meet every need, speak specifically and directly to those who have challenged you to do that, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated today. Amen in the house of the Lord. This is one of those stories within Scripture that we find ourselves often in ourselves. Here were a group of people who had for many years been lost in a wilderness. They had been lost without knowing exactly what to do. And they were lost because they had been given an opportunity years before to do something wonderful. They had been asked by God to step out on faith, to believe that he could do whatever they needed him to do. But the majority of the people decided to go against that particular call. And so they found themselves for the next three and a half decades in a wilderness. But what I want to do is take you back to that moment in time, that capsule when there was an opportunity that was availed, given to this entire nation and yet, there were only a couple that recognized it could be done. It was possible. It could be something they could receive. Those two men were Joshua and Caleb. They were young men at this time in their life, somewhere between the age of 20 and 30. They were just now beginning to live. Their faith was strong, their confidence high. They were willing to stretch themselves beyond the norm and become something more than just ordinary people of God. And so as they came back from spying out this beautiful country, the land of Palestine or Canaan, that place where God wanted to put His select people and grow them and mature them, and from them, from them would come the Messiah, it was in this great land of opportunity that these two young men came back and they said, let us go up at once. We can do this thing. When you look in chapter 13, the 12 spies had come back after 40 days. They came back to all of the congregation of Israel. And this is what they said. We came into a land that you sent us. And it sure does flow with milk and honey. And this is some of the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people, they're strong, that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, or the giants. We saw the Amalekites in the south, the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and the coast of Jordan. They said, we went up, we saw the land. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. It, it is beyond description. It is breathtaking. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a land of prosperity. It's a land where success could be acquired. It is a land where we found great fruit. It is truly a prosperous place. It is a paradise. We've been living in a wilderness, but I'm telling you, it is truly something worth looking at. But then, then they began to describe, but also we saw there, we saw there these great nations. We saw there these great men. We saw there these great groups of people. We saw the Amalekites and the Canaanites and the Hittites, Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites. We saw all of these 
bodies of people. And we don't think that we're capable, qualified, or able to go up and take the land. Matter of fact, they went on to say, we're not able to do this. They're stronger than we are. They said, we saw giants, the sons of Anak, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. They, they said, we like the land. We see the opportunity. We know that it's as beautiful and as prosperous as God has told us, but we just don't believe that we can overcome the obstacles that we would encounter. We do not believe that we could overcome the problems that we would find. We, we just don't believe that we are strong enough at this point to be able to fight against those great nations of people. As a matter of fact, we realize that not only is our faith weak, but our mind is also frail. And we look in the mirror and see ourselves not as conquerors, but the conquered. We see ourselves not as the children of a great God who brought us through a Red Sea, who has provided provision in this great wilderness, who has given us the power to build this great tabernacle. But we see ourselves as grasshoppers. We see ourselves as insignificant people. I don't know if you know it, but grasshoppers are not the thing you want to compare yourself to. They basically live and die in just a very few short weeks. All they basically do is eat. There's not really any purpose. There's really nothing about them. But to a, a grasshopper is basically an insignificant animal. They make a lot of noise. They scare the ladies from time to time. But ultimately they live and die and never truly do anything worthwhile. And yet, that's the way that the people saw themselves. That's the way that these ten spies saw themselves. They sized themselves up. Now, before you judge them, let me just let you know, these were not just a few of the riffraff of Israel. These were not just a few young men that didn't have any purpose, didn't have any background, didn't have any standing. But these young men came from the great, heads of the tribes of Israel. These were princes among the people of God. These were qualified men. They were like the Daniel and the Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego of the book of Daniel. These were the princes of their generation. These were the up-and-coming young leaders and rulers of that nation. These were godly young men who had tremendous upside and potential. They came from good pedigree. Their lineages are the lineages that the children of Israel came from. But yet when they faced obstacles in their life, they would rather quit than struggle. They would rather throw in the towel than fight the fight. They would rather believe the report that said, I cannot, rather than to believe that they could. And so those ten young men, their lives were snuffed out. They were destroyed by the fire of God. And yet there stood before the children of Israel two young, courageous, charismatic young men named Joshua and Caleb. And both of them spoke, and this is what they said. Caleb, the young man, said, we are well able to overcome it. We, we can do this. Don't you like people that say, we can? Yeah. Amen. Oh, don't you like the children of God that when they face things in their life, it doesn't matter if the mountain is huge. It doesn't matter if it's Mount Everest or if it's the rock of Gibraltar. It doesn't matter if it's a huge Pacific or Atlantic Ocean. It doesn't matter if the winds that are blowing are hurricane force or the waves that are rolling up on the beaches of the life were caused by a tsunami. It doesn't matter if it's a typhoon, but they've just got this underlying confidence that if God sends me, God can make it work. If God is for me, it'll work out. All I've got to do is put my hand on the plow and refuse to look back, refuse to abdicate, refuse to surrender or submit. If I will believe in God as much as God believes in me, we can do this thing. We're able to overcome. And so Caleb, this young man, 
His voice, his dialect, his speech was so different than the others. And then standing beside him was Joshua, the future leader of this great nation. And Joshua, he spoke a few more sentences. And this is what he said. It was my text, if the Lord delight in us. If the Lord delights in us. Any of you think God kind of likes you? Does anybody here think God likes you? If he delights in us. Joshua said, if the Lord likes us. That's what it says. Is there anybody who thinks God likes you? He said, if God likes us, if he delights in us, if the Lord likes us, then he will bring us into this land. If the Lord likes me, then he will ensure my victory. If the Lord delights in me, then he will bring us into this land and he will give it us. You know the difference between believers and unbelievers is simply the fact that believers realize they're not doing it by themselves. For just a few moments, let me speak from this subject. Believing the un. Believable. See, the hardest thing to believe in is the fact that God believes in you. You know, it was not the walled cities and the giants and all of the things that these other ten said that was truly the crux of the matter, the real problem for their dilemma or the reason they were willing to surrender and acquiesce and quit. It was that they did not truly believe that God liked them. Have you ever had somebody really liked you? Man, when you've got somebody that really likes you, then you know you're on good standing, things are going to work out, especially if the person that likes you is powerful, if the person that likes you has opportunity to make your life better, if the person that likes you is for you. Have you ever had anybody that just said, you know, I'm for you? I like you. I like your red hair. I like your freckles. I, I like the way you are. I like the way you speak. I just like you. Have you ever had anybody that said, I like you, and because I like you, I'm going to open doors for you. I'm going to make ways for you. I'm going to make things work out for you. Hey, friend of mine, if you ever realize he likes you, then you'll do like Joshua. He said, if God likes us, he'll bring us into this land. He'll give it to us, and he said, it is truly a great land. He said, only rebel not you against the Lord. He said, but if God is for you, then please don't deny him. Don't, don't, don't put him in a position where you do not believe in him. You know, life is really about believing the unbelievable. It's really about doing the impossible. The Bible said we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. When you understand that believing is a fixing, adhering, clinging to something that is not within your power, in your capacity, but it is within the power of those that are with you, in the power of Him that is guiding you, believing the unbelievable. When Jesus Christ came to Martha and Mary, Lazarus had been dead for several days and he simply said if you believe you'll see what God can do if you just believe if you'll just cling to me and hold to me and, and affix your word affix your life to my words you just watch what I can do for you when you can understand that believing the unbelievable is what gives you that which is in Incredible. If you can realize that what God cherishes more than your gifts, your abilities, your ambitions, is the fact that you can believe in Him because He truly already believes in you. And so Caleb said, don't rebel against the Lord. Just believe what he said. Neither fear you the people of the land. Have you ever quit doing something because somebody was in the path? Have you ever let something go because you were fearful of the people that were around you? Is there anybody you don't sing in church anymore because you're afraid of what people might say? Is there anybody that's ever quit pursuing a dream because someone stood in your path and they mocked that dream or they made fun of that dream or they said you'll never get that dream? Is there anybody here today your life is not where it could be because you are fearful of those who stood in your path? 
Is there anybody who's ever had a giant in your life? The giant that has just stood there like Goliath stood for 40 days and he just challenged the people of God. He challenged the king and all the mighty men and he said, send me a man to fight with me. Come on, somebody. Come come across this valley. Let's do war together and for 40 days and 40 nights. That old giant would yell across the valley and not one man would ever leave his tent. The great Saul was, who was tall and stern and strong. He wouldn't go out to face him. None of those mighty men that later became such men of renown were willing to cross the valley. None of David's brothers who would later on become a part of the mightiest of the mighty were not willing to cross that valley that day and face that great giant. But there was a little boy who had built his life on believing the unbelievable. He had built his future on believing that a little boy could face a giant because he had faced a lion and he had faced a bear and he had faced the obstacles of being the last born of eight other brothers. He was the runt if you will but he had grew up knowing that if I'm ever going to get to the head of the class I've got to believe the unbelievable. I've got to believe the unbelievable. See, David's story is much like yours. Here he was, one of eight brothers. And matter of fact, he was so insignificant in his father's eyes that when the prophet come by to anoint one of those young men as the king, his dad didn't even act as if he existed. Matter of fact, it was only after Samuel said, is this all of them? That he finally, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got that sissy out there. We got that little, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I got one more. You know, have you ever felt like that one more in your family? <laughs> you know, because in every family there's the prima donna and there's the donna that doesn't have a prima. You know, in every family there's the runt, you know. The one everybody walks on, everybody pushes to the side, everybody, you know, just takes advantage of and takes for granted. You know, I, I know you're not looking around right now, but if you've ever been the runt, you realize if you're the runt, if you're the last, you've got to have a belief that's greater than everyone else huh? because if you're firstborn, you just come out with the gifts. Huh? You just come out with the inheritance. Huh? You come out with all the blessings. Huh? But if you're the Jacob, you're going to have to grab hold of something. Huh? If you're the one that comes last, huh? you've got to be willing to do something radical to become first. And so oftentimes, uh, you got to believe the unbelievable. How many times have you looked in your life uh, and you, you saw your kin folks and men, they were gifted, and you saw your brother and he was like a great saw, and you saw your sister and she was like the wonderful, you know, uh, Bathsheba, and you just felt so insignificant. You, you felt so little. Uh, you felt, man, I'm overlooked and uh, nobody cares about me, and look, I'll never be anything. Uh, but one day, uh, you came to grips with this fact, God likes me. God likes me. The Lord is on my side. You see, we don't understand that, but all around the world today, there are people playing in athletics. There are people running businesses. There are people that are absolutely the icons of their world. And it was not because they came into the world with a silver spoon and a gold ring, but somewhere in life, somebody took them underneath their wing and said, I believe in you. And the moment somebody believes in you, you can begin to believe in the unbelievable. And that's why Joshua said, hey, don't give up. Don't abdicate. Don't throw in the towel. Do you understand that if God is for us, that anything standing in our path is bread for us? Bread for us. What a, what a, what a wonderful metaphor. Bread for us. It, really, if you have the right concept, obstacles are blessings. Difficulties are blessings. Problems are blessings. People saying you can't do it are blessings. If you have the right perspective, what is standing in front of you is really the fuel that can cause you to rise to where God wants you. Jesus Christ came into his own and his own received him not. But 
to them that believed on him, to them he gave them the power to become the sons of God. What was Jesus Christ all about? Everyone was against him, but he used that as the stepping stone to glory. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They're going to nail me to a tree, but they're going to open up a tomb. They're going to kill me on a day, but tomorrow, three days from now, I'm going to rise again, and they're going to realize what they really were was nothing more than the bread, the fuel. Have you ever looked at your problems and realized you need them? You know, most of us look at our past and we want it to pass on, pass away. Most of us avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it or pass away. But do you understand, anything you faced in your life with the right perspective can be food for you. It can be the source of your strength. It can be the thing that causes you to capitulate, to, to catapult yourself into a place where you're willing to do what you're called to do. He said, they're bread for us. What a different perspective. One group says, we're grasshoppers in our own eyes and grasshoppers in their eyes. Another guy said, man, they're bread for us. They're bread for us. They're bread for us. It, it, it's amazing that perspective changes everything. If you understood that whatever's happened in your life, it can be a very negative poison. Or it can be turned into the antidote that cures your future. Now, no one got it. No one is going to get through life unscathed, and no one's going to get through life clean. But the problem that so many people have is they only see the obstacle, not the opportunity. They only see the things that have come against them, not the things that are working with them. They only see the winds that are blowing in their face. They never realize the wind that is blowing behind their back. But Joshua said, hey, God is with us. He likes us there they are going to be bread for us. And then he makes another incredible statement, their defense. Everybody say their defense. You know, that's the reason we don't do things in life because we realize that there is opposition. And if there's opposition, that means there's going to be a battle. And if there's going to be a battle, that means there's going to be a victor and a loser. And some of us are so afraid to lose, we refuse to fight. Because that's all we understand is losing. Because ever since we grew up, we've only been dealt that losing mentality. I cannot, I will not. Look where I come from. Look what happened to me. But God is saying, I like you. God is saying, I'm behind you. Do you really believe it's an accident that out of almost 7 billion people in the world, you're still alive? And you're still here in your right mind, or at least most of us are? And if God is for you, who can be against you? But have you ever looked at everything in front of you that's keeping you from getting to where you want to get and, and just said, you know what? It looks um, immovable. It looks impassable. It looks impossible. But have you ever looked at it and you said, you know what? Their defense is departed from them. You know, have you ever met a dog that seemed real bad till you met strength with strength? Have you ever met someone that they talked a real good talk but as soon as you clock them upside the nose, they stopped. Amen. Have you ever been in anywhere in your life where your back was against the wall, but you refused to quit? And you said, you know what? I'm about to push forward. And as you push forward, you realize what you thought was a mountain was a vapor. What you thought was immovable was nothing but a wisp of smoke. What you thought was going to take you a long time was just not going to take but a few moments because it looked big, it looked brass, it looked mighty, but it was really insignificant. And it, because oftentimes we blow up the world to make it huge and we diminish ourselves to make us small. He said their defense has departed from them. And the Lord is with us. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He kept reiterating, and the Lord is with us. Would you do any? Would you do anything more in your life if you th knew He was with you? Amen. I mean, would you take a greater risk if you knew He was with you? See, believing the unbelievable starts with what Abraham said: "Who against hope believed in hope." Have you ever done something? People say, "Boy, that don't make sense." Believing the unbelievable doesn't make sense. But have you ever did something that other people said, that's not going to work? You do understand that 
What you call impossible, somebody will make possible tomorrow. What you stand and say, well, I don't think anybody will ever do that. Somebody will do that. And you know what? People will do something that you can't duplicate because it was their moment. You know, the, the Wright brothers, when they flew that contraption, they flew it. It worked out. They survived it. Just a few weeks ago, a couple of old guys, 75 and 69, they built a replica of that. They even had some new stuff on it. It crashed and they both died. Because you see, sometimes in life it's your moment. Sometimes in life it is God saying, this is your day, Joshua. Everybody else may not want this moment. Everybody else may say it's too big, it's too difficult, it's too large. But this is your moment. Do you understand that there's people here in this building today, other people do not want to go where you want to go. But that's because you believe in something that they're not willing to believe. See, Joshua and Caleb, they believed. They believed that God could do it. They refused to live in a wilderness the rest of their life. They didn't care that God was throwing out free food. They didn't care that they weren't getting sick. They didn't care that their clothes were not wearing out or that there was nothing going wrong in their life. They simply wanted to believe that God could take them to a greater place, that God could take them to a better place. Is there anybody you know where you're at is a good place because God is in it, but God is saying, Jordan, would you like to go somewhere else? He He's saying, Alonzo, would you like to go a little higher? He's saying, Brother Stafford, would you like to climb a little more? He's offering you an opportunity to go to another level. He's offering you an opportunity to go gain something that he wants to give you. If you could only understand how much God wants to give you what you've never had. They'd never had a promised land. They'd never had a Canaan in their life. They'd never had this wonder. But the Lord was standing there and He said, I'd like for you to have this. I'd like to give this to you. I know right now you can't see it for what it is because there's a lot of things in its way. But I want to give this to you. But those ten could only see that somebody else had it. They could only, they said, well, the Amalekites have that. The Canaanites have that. The Jebusites, the Hittites, the Amorites, they, ever, somebody's already got it. But God said, you know what? I want to give it to you. There's people in this building right now. God has a promised land for you, but you're a coward. You're afraid. You're intimidated. You've got the wrong mentality. The, ins the insignificance of your past is, is, is flowing into you and causing you not. Quit looking at the obstacles. And for the first time in your life, realize the future is full of opportunities God wants you to have. See, that's what's so beautiful about it. They had lived their life prior to this time in Egypt, under the rulership and dominance and control of others. They had never known freedom, nothing but bondage and hardship. They, they didn't know what it was like to be free, to make choice, to be able to walk and do what they wanted to do. Every day somebody told them what to do. Every day there were commands. They were raised up in families where mom and dad worked all of the time for the great empire, building great cities. They, they understood hardship and lack and without and all of that. And now on the other side of the Red Sea, six weeks from the day that they crossed it, God was telling them, hey, I'm giving you an opportunity to have what you've never had, to go where you've never gone, to enjoy what you've never enjoyed. And whatever the percentage is, one of you beautifully brilliant mathematicians, if there's 12 people and 10 of them say no, what, percent of the, what percentage said no? This is when you can talk in church. Boy, y'all, mm -hmm. it's amazing. People that can tell me everything I need to do when I need a little help, they can't say nothing. All these 
iPhones, all these computers, all these intellectuals. So basically, what is it, 76%? Okay, thank you. Forget it. Y'all don't care. Let's do it like this. They were 12 and 10 said no. <laughs> and that's basically the odds that I'm working with in this building this morning. In a few minutes, I'm going to give y'all an opportunity to come accept this message. And basic, I can tell you right now, 80, 10 of y'all are going to go home and say, no, I don't want that. There will be basically, what is it? 82%. 82% of you are more interested in a happy meal than you are a, a Canaan promised land. Matter of fact, have you ever noticed that that's the, basically the ratio around at the end of a service? The ratio is always about 18% except the ministry's call. And about 82%, they have another call that's greater than the ministry call. Have you ever noticed in your life that very few people really take advantage of what life has for them? Have you ever noticed that most people are always ordinary and it's not because they're not gifted, talented, ambitious. It's because every time they get close, they refuse to face the giants. They refuse to get what is theirs. They refuse to push forward because they do not believe the unbelievable. The unbelievable is you can have this. The unbelievable is God is with you. The unbelievable is that God has wanted you to have more than you have. He said their defenses depart. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? That's what he's saying. Their defenses departed. If the defense is gone, then you can do this. How many's ever wanted the odds stacked in your favor? Some of you probably have a pick six in your pocket today. That's an odd that is stacked against you. Those odds are innumerable. But this morning, the Bible says God wants to give you a land. Houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, cities you didn't build. I want to give you something you've never had in your life. All you've got to do is believe the unbelievable. Do you know the hardest thing to do? as you get older, is to continue to believe with the same childlike faith that you used to believe with? Have you noticed as you get older, you get dull? Have you noticed as you get older, you get more pessimistic? That's why we start looking to retire rather than refire. Have you ever, have you ever met a 21-year-old kid saying, man, I, uh, what are you going to do this with your life this year? I'm going to retire. Now, many of them never get started, so we understand that. But for those who get started, I, you know what would happen if you can come home at 21 and say, Dad, I'm about ready to retire. I'd look at him like he lost his mind. You're fixing to retire when you've got the best chance of success. I mean, you're on the cusp of greatness, and you're about to say no? Believe the unbelievable. Some of you today as I close, you're so close to a Canaan in your life. But you're going to have to do three things. Number one, you're going to have to quit listening to those people that are close to you. Well, that went over good, didn't it? You know, you can get advice from everywhere, but there's some advice that's not good for you. When God's about to take you on a journey of impossibility, what you've got to have is somebody who agrees. And I'll be honest with you, if you ever decide to do something great, 82% of your confidence will be against it. And 18% will be for it. I promise you, you'll get a whole lot more nays than yays. Anybody agree with that? Anybody ever tried that? You just come home tomorrow. And tell honey you're fixing to become a, I don't know, Superman or something. <laughs> I agree, living with you. <laughs> he got it going on, baby. <laughs> nah, it's a good guy right here. Brother Jerry, is it not true that when you get ready to do something really real in your life, you usually have to get it in spite of what everybody else says. Now, I agree. Advice is wonderful. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Everybody say safety. But there's not direction. And remember, it's direction that gives you Canaan. See, the, the team came back and they said, Hey, guys, just, I tell you what, it's a little safer over here. 
I'll just be honest with you. We, we looked at it, and our counsel is, if we just stay in the wilderness, it's safer. Because we got a cloud by day and a fire by night. we got God clothing us, feeding us, taking care of us. We're not having to do any battles. We're not having to fight any fights. We're not having to do anything. We're just enjoying the beauty of God's provision. But if you decide to cross over the Jordan River, man, there's big cities, big guys, big obstacles, and we just don't think it's going to be worth it. And then Joshua and Caleb say, it is worth it. <laughs> we can do this. What do you think the people did? You think they got like a standing ovation? Anybody think they really? You know, have you ever went against the grain and got a standing ovation? Have you ever did what other people said you shouldn't do? And they patted you on the back? No. Not momentarily they won't. But when it works out, you watch them come out of the closets. Man, I knew you could do that. Yeah, I, I was pulling for you. <laughs> I was with you. If you ever do what, you sh what God calls you to do, and you do it against popular opinion, and if you ever do what God calls you to do, you will do it against popular opinion. Abraham did it against popular opinion. Moses did it against popular opinion. David did it against popular opinion. Daniel did it against popular opinion. John the Baptist, Peter, Paul, James, John, Jesus. I mean, is there anybody that's ever done anything that God's called them to do? And the whole world said yes. No, it is always the opposite. The more people that say no, the better chance it is. It's God's will. And this is how you know you're getting real close to the will of God in your life. And all the congregation picked up some stones. And said, we're finna, we finna get rid of you guys. Because <laughs> when you really get close to the will of God in your life, get ready. There's a fight coming. Because the will of God has always tried to be aborted. I mean, when Moses was born, they were killing all of the children trying to abort the future. When Jesus was born, they were killing all the children trying to abort the future. Because I want you to know, if your future is as great as God wants it to be, I can promise you there's somebody trying to destroy it. And many times, it's the own congregation that is around you. The Bible said the congregation made stone them with stones. Boy, have you ever been crucified by Christians? Now, for y'all get all happy, say, yeah, I have. Some of y'all have been crucifying the Christians. I've been around Christians long enough to know <laughs> if you have any enemies, have them outside of the church. They have mercy. Because <laughs> in the church, Christians, when they turn violent, they turn violent, don't they? But you know what? Those two boys were about to get stoned with stones. I, I mean, everybody was against them. Everybody was opposed to them. Everybody's like, no, we're not doing what you said. I mean, they were opposed to him. I, I'm talking about, it wasn't just little people opposed to him. The Bible said all the congregation were opposed to what they said. And all they were saying is, we're going to believe the unbelievable. We're going to believe that God is in this. We're going to believe that God is going to help us. We're going to believe that God is going to give this. And this is the beauty of it. I close. And the congregation was about to stone them to death and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? He said, Moses, do you know how weary it is to keep dealing with people that refuse to believe the unbelievable. <laughs> Do you understand how frustrating it is to not find people who are willing to get their Canaan regardless of the giants, the obstacles? Do you know how difficult it is for me to keep dealing with people who will not believe? But he said, man, I'm so happy for these two boys, Caleb and Joshua. He said, these two young men will see what nobody else gets to see. These two young men will experience what nobody else gets to experience.